Well, good morning, Northland. How are y'all doing today? Pretty good? It's a beautiful day out. That's getting me excited. Well, that little trailer that you just saw is for a new musical called The Last Adam, which is the reimagined story of Jesus for today's generation. And we at Northland are really excited to be hosting them coming up May 9th and 10th. It looks like it's gonna be an amazing show. So if you'd like to join us on those evenings, you can purchase tickets on our website, or you can also head to the bookstore and get your tickets there. Be sure to check it out. Well, would you stand with us? And let's pray as we begin our time of worship this morning. Father God, you are good. We thank you for all the good things in our lives because we know they come from you. And Lord, you know each and every one of our hearts so intimately and you know that we've each brought in something different this morning. So we thank you that you don't ask us to check that at the door. In fact, you invite us to bring it right to your feet. So God, would you help us lay down and surrender what needs to be given to you this morning? Quiet our hearts so that we could hear your voice, voice clearly. And God, we just ask that you would make us aware of the movement of your spirit in this place. We know you move in a mighty way. We ask these things in Jesus' name, amen.
Yes, indeed, we worship a God who makes the way where there is no way. And that's why we sing and celebrate the miracle that is the gospel. So let's sing that together. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb in desperation.
just good to worship with you all in this place. And it's good to remind ourselves often that worship doesn't actually only happen through music. I'm sure you know that. Romans 12 tells us that worship is in fact a whole body, whole life sacrifice. And so it does look like engaging with music and songs that lift up the name of Jesus, our Savior, our living hope. But it also looks like meditating and listening on the words of scripture. And it looks like offering all we have to the one who gives us everything we need. And so if you call North and Church your home, we invite you to participate in worship through the giving of your tithe in our service, because that's worship too. And so there are multiple ways that you can do that. In your worship guide, there's a QR code that you can scan to give your tithe virtually. And we also have stations in the back of the sanctuary as well as in the foyer where you can give physical tithes of cash or checks. But let's intentionally set aside this time to offer all we are, all we have, to the one who gives us everything we need, to take physical action in worship as a whole life, whole body sacrifice.
Amen, church. Before you guys take a seat, get to know something about the people around you. Ask them, uh, shoe, shoe, tie, tie, or shoe, tie, shoe, tie. Go for it. Well, greetings, Northland family, from Pastor Gus and myself. We are continuing on the Footsteps of Paul a journey. So, Pastor Gus, why don't you tell the fam where we are right now? Hi, family. We are here in the ancient city of Ephesus, where the Apostle Paul came, and we are standing in the place that he walked. What did he do here? Yeah, so we're actually standing in the theater of Ephesus, and so at some point he probably preached here, and you can find that in Acts 19. You're actually going to learn a little bit about Acts 19 today, but this theater could seat about 25,000 people because the population at that time was about 250,000 people. Now, here's some things that we know about Ephesus is that Paul spent about two years, three months here, and it was basically his base of operation, and it was because because of his base that the whole province of Asia was able to hear the word of the Lord. And so just to be able to stand where the Apostle Paul stood so many years ago, it, it does. It just brings an overwhelming joy uh, and, and gra gratefulness to my heart. And so, Pastor Gus, anything that you want to share kind of with the Northland family about what this journey and this experience has meant to you? Right here, being in Ephesus, it helps us to see that what Paul did here had other implications. It was here, he had a young pastor that he had discipled and was a leader. Timothy was a pastor here. Yeah. That is one thing that really thrills me about making disciples and seeing them discipling others and leading. But there were other things that happened here while Paul was here in Ephesus. This was also the place where he was able to write letters to the other churches that he was discipling, specifically 1 Corinthians. Yeah, and so so Ephesus actually played a, such a central role in Paul's ministry. So not only did he spend a lot of time here and write letters here and leave one of his young mentees here, but it was also in Ephesus where Jesus is going to actually talk about the church here. And that's in actually Revelation chapter 2 where he encourages the church of Ephesus to recover their first love, that they were great at dealing Deeds. They, they, they had great theology, but they had allowed their deeds and their theology to be disconnected from their relationship with the Lord. And so Jesus just says, hey, I need, I need you to recover and renew the love that you had for me at the very beginning. So that's what, that's just in a small little nutshell, all of the things that happened in the city of Ephesus. And one more thing, I mean, he actually wrote a letter to yes. the church at Ephesus called uh, the book of Ephesians. Ephesians and so right. we'll just end on that. Well, Northland family, we love you. Yes. We miss you. Cannot wait to be back with you next week. And actually, I'll be preaching on Acts chapter 20 where Paul, he meets with the Ephesian elders and gives them some parting instructions for before he continues on. And so, hey, we love you. Blessings. Bye-bye. Yeah, well, it's great to hear from Pastor Josh and Pastor Gus about how their trip in Ephesus is going. But we here at Northland have the great privilege of continuing in our Empowered series through the Book of Acts with a dear friend of Northland's. So would you please join me in giving a heartfelt welcome to Dr. Steve Brown. I would stand, but I'm too old. <laughs> it's a lot harder for me than it is for you. I am a friend of Northland. Do you know that I was here uh, back before there was a skating rink when John Christensen was the pastor, the first one, and I loved him, and in those days I knew 
that there was something very special and different about this church. Over the years, I've known every one of your pastors and I've loved them. And each time I see God beginning to move and continuing to do so in the lives of the people at Northland. And then in the last few months, I've gotten to know your pastor, Josh, and I absolutely love him. He is, he is so anointed of God. I don't know where you find these guys. I'm so impressed. Uh, and the place still smells like Jesus. And I've missed you guys. Let's, uh, let's pray and then we'll study. Father, as we come into your presence, we're always surprised that we're here. We're certainly not here because we're good or smart or faithful or obedient. We're here because we're yours. We can remember where you found us in the dark, the guilt and the loneliness, the fear, the shame, the regret. They told us that if we read the Bible and studied and prayed a lot and were good, that you would love us. And we tried. And then with tears, we turn to leave. And then your voice, welcome child, welcome. And we came running. Father, we're here by invitation and it's yours. And it doesn't get higher or better than that. You know every person in this place. The hard places and the soft places, the tears and the laughter. You know it all. You know the sleepless nights, the secrets we can't share, the sin we can't shed. Meet us in this place. May we hear the soft sound of sandaled feet. And Father, as always, we pray for the one who teaches that you would forgive him his sins because there are many. We would see Jesus and him only. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. You may have heard this story about the little boy who went to Sunday school and when he got home, his father said, son, what did they teach you in Sunday school? And he said, well, daddy, they, they taught me that Moses and God's people were running from the Egyptians and they came to the Red Sea and they couldn't get across. And then they found some large hoses and they sucked all the water up and it was dry and they could walk on the dry land. And then the jets came in and destroyed all the Egyptians. The father said, son, is that what they taught you? And he said, well, daddy, not exactly, but you wouldn't believe what they said. <laughs> You know, the problem with most of us as Christians is that over time, we stop believing what the Bible says about us. Over time, and this is something they don't tell you about being a mature Christian, over time, 
It's easy to slip away and to say, no big deal. To forget the excitement and the darkness of the place where he found you. Let me tell you a story. His name was Maynard Watkins, and he was the chief pilot of Pan Am Airlines back when it was one of the largest in the world and a great airlines. He was also a member of my church. He was also my beloved friend. In those days, and I still do, I was anxious about flying. I spend my life on airplanes, and I've never put all my weight on one yet. And Maynard said, I'm going to fix that. And so he invited me over to the headquarters of Pan Am Airlines, and for two nights, he put me through a flight training program. I flew the simulator and crashed it three times. I went through all of the safety procedures. I learned stuff you wouldn't believe. And when it was over, he said, now, Steve, don't you feel better? And I said, Maynard, I never knew so much could go wrong with an airplane. <laughs> One time, I was flying from Miami, where I was serving, to Los Angeles to speak for a conference, and there was a layover in Dallas, Fort Worth. And while I was waiting for my plane, a voice came over the speaker system of the Dallas, Fort Worth airport, and somebody said, would Dr. Steve Brown please come to one of the paging phones? And I thought, good night. Nobody knows I'm here. What is this about? Must be bad. And so I got up and started down the hall toward a paging. And all of a sudden, I see Maynard Walken sitting there. He looked up and saw me and turned white. I said, Maynard, what are you doing here? He said, oh, Steve, my mother died three days ago and I... And I'm just coming back from the service. I was with her uh, when she was on her deathbed, and it was so hard. And I was sitting here and praying. And I was saying, Lord, it would be so good. I wish I could see Steve and we could pray together. And it would really. And then I opened my eyes, and you were standing there. I don't believe this. And I said, I don't either. And I sat down, I hugged him, and we cried together and we prayed together. And then I got up and thought, you know, I ought to check that page. And so I looked for a phone, found one, got on it, and said, this is Steve Brown and you paged me. And the lady said, wait just a minute. And I waited. She came back and she said, I'm sorry, Mr. Brown. We have no record of anybody paging Steve Brown. How about that? I believe those are the stories that happen in the lives of Christians all the time. But sometimes it's hard to believe. And so I want to fix it for myself today. Help. And I want to fix it for you too. Help you too. If you have a Bible or device where your scriptures are, I'm reading and look around and see who doesn't. <laughs> you can feel self-righteous. And there, there's a lot to be said for self-righteousness. I'm going to start in the first verse of the 19th chapter, and it's Ephesus. And they were just talking about the city of Ephesus. And Dr. Luke writes as follows. And it happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the island country and came to Ephesus. There he found some disciples. 
And he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you first believed? And they said, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, into what were you baptized? And they said, into John's baptism. And Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. There were about 12 men in all. And he entered the synagogue and for three months spoke boldly, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. But when they became stubborn and continued in unbelief, speaking evil of the way before the congregation, he withdrew from them and took the disciples with him, reasoning daily in the hall of Tyrannus. They continued for two years so that the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Gentiles. Well, I don't want to, but the text does speak to about tongues and I suspect I ought to say something about it. I'm Presbyterian, we don't do that. We don't laugh much either. And we don't dance. And we don't kid. And we're very, very serious. Let me tell you what happened to this Presbyterian. I have a daughter, or we have a daughter named Jennifer. When she was one day old, she was very sick. And the doctors, and they called specialists, were very concerned. I'm not a good person. I'm grumpy, I'm angry. Sometimes I'm nice, but I love my family. And I love Jennifer and she was only one day old. Two weeks and I was an intellectual too. Yeah. Two weeks before that time, I'd met some charismatics. I thought they were weird and told them so. I thought they had serious psychological problems and they were working it out in that gibberish. But there was something about them. They knew how to pray and I didn't. And so when Jennifer was sick, I went to them and told them what had happened. And they said, oh, we're so sorry, let's pray. And they joined hands and they asked Jesus to come and heal Jennifer. The next morning, my wife called from the hospital and she said, did anybody pray last night? And I said, well, yeah. And she said, the doctor came in this morning and said, I don't understand it. This is miraculous. Amen. But Jennifer is fine. I had a problem with that, yeah. I still have a problem with that. I've buried more babies than you can imagine. Babies who belong to parents who are far more godly and faithful than I am. And I, and I don't understand that. But I want you to know I rise up and call those charismatics blessed. And I don't make fun of Pentecostals and thunderstorms. I want you to know that too. <laughs> Listen, if you're really sick, if things are really bad, do you want a Calvinist or a charismatic to pray for you? <laughs> the answer is obvious. There is a teaching and it's in reform circles that the tongues have ceased. 
prophecy has ceased. The sign gifts have ceased because we have the word, the canon is closed and that's all we need. And that's nonsense. You're playing with fire when you start telling God what he can and cannot do. God does as he pleases and he does it right well. So if God decides to keep on using those gifts, I'm good with that. <laughs> now that I've offended one side, let me offend the other side. If you're old, you don't care. That's the good thing. In fact, when you want to know the truth, you ought to listen to somebody old. We don't give a rip. When I was young, when I was young, I was concerned about what you thought. I was looking at my career. I was being very, very careful. Now I'm old and I don't care. So if you want to know the truth, listen to an old guy. And this is the truth too. For those of you who are Pentecostal or charismatic, I'm not sure that the thing you call tongues is what God was talking about in scripture. However, I don't think he's uptight about that. <laughs> Certainly not as uptight as some Christians are. I think God says, I love you a lot. And if you feel better, you go to it. Okay, that's all I know about that. <laughs> Number of years ago, uh, I wrote a book on the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. The title of that book was Follow the Wind. Up to that time, there were very few popular books that had been written on the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. And I was asked by a publisher to write one, and so I did. And I thought that I was gonna be helping the body of Christ. And I found out that I wasn't, I was writing for myself. The more I researched and worked on that book, the more I said, wow. And then backwards, wow. I learned so much about what God is doing in the world but more so what he was doing in my life. I realized the book wasn't for them, the book was for me. And when I began to see what the Holy Spirit does and how the Holy Spirit does and to whom the Holy Spirit does it, I had personal revival and awakening. And now I'm kind of running out of gas and so it's my hope this sermon will, like that book, speak to me as much as it does to you. Listen up. You're forgiven. No, I don't, I mean really forgiven. You say, but Steve, you don't know what I've done. If you knew, you would know better. No. You're forgiven that. Some of you have secrets inside and you're thinking if Steve knew he wouldn't say that, that particular sin is forgiven forever. And if you did it tomorrow, it would be forgiven then too. And if you doubled up and did it next week, you would be forgiven for that, you're forgiven, deal with it. Not only that, you're loved. You say, well, I know that. I, that's God's job description. You're light. <laughs> you know, he loves, he likes you. And let me tell you something else. He will never be angry at you ever again, ever. It's called the imputation of Christ's righteousness. And that means that when you came to him, you were forgiven and that's cool. That's no mean thing. But at the same time, you were clothed, imputed with all of the goodness and the obedience and the faithfulness and the righteousness of Jesus Christ himself. 
And so when I stand before you, I'm the best person you know. I'm the most faithful person you know. I'm the most obedient person you know, except yourself. Because of the imputed righteousness of Christ, when you stand before God, you stand clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Not only that, Jesus can't have a party unless you're there. You don't have to plead with him to show in your life. He haunts you and follows you and loves you and parties with you in your laughter and cries with you in your tears and keeps and counts your tears, the psalmist says, in a bottle. Not only that, this is going to continue forever. Because <laughs> a dead man got out of a grave and said we could do, we're going to live forever. This is never, ever going to stop. And you say, Steve, how do you know that? The Word told me, but a lot of books tell me that. So there has to be another element. What is that element? It's the element of God's Spirit who takes the truth, and the truth I'm teaching you this morning applies it to your head, drops it to your heart, puts it in your vocal cords, and you laugh, and you laugh, and you laugh, and you dance. When I was working on this, I came across an Arabian axiom. You may have heard this, it was new to me. There are four parts of it. First, there are those who think they know and don't, and they are fools and you should shun them. There are those who don't know and don't know they don't know, they are students, teach them. There are those who know and don't know they know, they're asleep, wake them up. And there are those who know and know they know, they are wise, follow them. When I read that, I was studying Acts 19, and I went, son of a gun. That would be a wonderful outline for a sermon. So that's what I'm going to do. And I'm not going to be long, because I'm getting hungry, too. <laughs> First, there are those who don't know and think they know, and they are fools Shun them. Notice what Paul did. Three months he was in the church teaching and they didn't like him, didn't like what he said and turned against him. Do you know what he did? He stayed because he was a suffering servant and he pled, no he didn't. He made an obscene gesture and he left. That's what he did. Who told him to do that? Jesus told him to do that. Where did he get the power to do that? From the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, if they won't listen to you, what are you to do? Shake the dirt off your sandals and go to somewhere where there are people who want to hear. Roe Brooks, my friend for a hundred years, was one of the early members of the staff of Campus Crusade for Christ years ago before it became crew. In those days, they didn't even have the printed four spiritual laws. The staff wrote it on the napkin when they're witnessing to people. <laughs> Roe was assigned to New England in the Boston area, and I was a pastor in that area and got to know him and loved him. He's a big old guy with a smile as 
big as the universe and winsome, oh my, but very clear on the truth. When he would, when he would enter Harvard campus, kids would scatter everywhere. They'd hide behind trees, hide behind garbage dumpsters trying to get away from him. And he caught one of the kids one time and the kid, and he put his hand on his shoulder and this young man said, Ro, leave me alone. I don't want to hear about Jesus anymore. I, I'm just tired of it. Leave me alone. And Rose said, okay. And he began to pray, Lord Jesus, I have a young man here who never wants to hear your name again. And I ask that you would leave him. And at that point, the kid was pulling on his shirt. He said, bro, I don't, I don't believe I want to go that far. <laughs> Listen to me. There's empowerment in walking. There's empowerment in saying to people, if you don't want to hear, I'll find somebody who wants to listen. If you're ever in trouble and you got any questions for me, call me and I may come and I may not come. That's empowerment. And you get that from the Holy Spirit and you find it in the 19th chapter of the book of Acts. But then there's a second thing. There are those who don't know and don't know they don't know. They are students, teach them. That's what Paul did. Did you get the Holy Spirit when you were baptized? What? We, we don't even know what that is. The teaching ministry. And then for three months and two years, Paul was pouring doctrine and propositional truth and revelation into the people that, to whom God had sent him. Let me give you some of my testimony. I was a pastor and I'd just gotten out of a graduate school of theology, Boston University. And they're just this side of Waco. I didn't know it, but they were. And so when I finally took a church on Cape Cod, I taught the Graf Wellhausen documentary hypothesis. I taught social ethics. I taught pastoral psychology that I learned. And you know what happened? Nothing happened. People are getting divorced, went ahead. People whose lives were falling apart were devastated. Nothing was healed, nothing was fixed, nothing was forgiven, and I was about to leave when I realized this isn't working and I had no authority. So I knelt down and said, I don't even know what it says, but, for, but I've got to have an authority and if this doesn't work, I'm leaving. And this book will be my authority. I had no idea what it said, but I knew that Billy Graham had said, start in the gospel of John. So that's what I did. And I stayed one verse ahead of that congregation. You know what happened? Awakening happened. I mean, the church started filling up with students from Harvard and MIT and Wellesley and, and uh, uh, we had evening services that you couldn't find a parking place and lives got changed. We had, weren't giving a dime to missions and we started a mission program with a missionary conference and we didn't even know what that was. And then it doubled and then it tripled and then it quadrupled and I'm reading a verse and I'm telling them what I think it means. And God was taking his word as in the book of Acts, the 19th chapter, putting in their heads, stirring them up and teaching me and them as students. The empowerment of truth spurned by the Holy Spirit. And then there are those who 
know and don't know they know. I mean, the Holy Spirit was theirs before Paul told them about it. Those who know and don't even know that they know, they are asleep, waken them. Years ago, a guy by the name of Don Richardson wrote a book called Eternity in Their Hearts. If you're old enough, you might remember it. But the thesis of that book was that in third world countries where the missionaries had never gone, they knew. Jesus had gone before the missionaries and they knew. A third world woman said, I knew there was a God like that somewhere. I just didn't know his name. I grew up in the mountains of North Carolina near the Cherokee Reservation. Good place. And I one time heard a lecture on Cherokee theology. Did you know that before the missionaries came, the Cherokee believed in a loving, kind, and merciful, and forgiving God? Did you know they had a doctrine of the Trinity similar to the doctrine of the Trinity you found in Scripture? And when the missionaries came and told them, they said, we knew. We just didn't know his name. I think there are a lot of Christians like that too. I think, I think sometimes we need to tell each other over and over and over again. Martin Luther said this. He said, we must preach the gospel to each other, lest we become discouraged. That's what I'm doing to you this morning. Don't bother to thank me, I was glad to help. <laughs> and that's what you should do to me, because the way is hard sometimes. Evil is rampant. And we need to remember who we are and whose we are. And we know. We just sometimes forget that we know. And when somebody tells us, God takes that truth with the Holy Spirit and applies it in our life, and you file that under empowerment. And then one more. There are those who know and who know that they know, they are wise, follow them. That's you, that's me. Talking about Christians, we're like weeds. We're everywhere and you can't get rid of us. And we know, and we know that we know, and we should never be intimidated by anybody who tries to shut us up. Amen. They're doing that to us. And we've got to, as you know, I taught in seminary for a hundred years, still do sometimes. I teach communications and preaching. The students, uh, often preach their first sermon in my class, scared to death. Or sometimes when they go back home for Thanksgiving or Christmas, their pastor asks them to preach and that scares them spitless. And I say to them, I'm gonna help. Before you get in a pulpit, self-talk, speak to yourself. And in your quiet way, speak to the congregation, even if they can't hear. And you need to say, get out of my way. I am for now the anointed servant of God, filled with his spirit and with a message that is important. And by God, you will listen. They say, <laughs> they often say, ah, I can't say that. And I say, yeah, you can, it'll help. 
And if you still feel guilty about it, ask his forgiveness after you preach and he'll forgive you. <laughs> you can say that too. You really can. Get out of my way. I'm anointed by the God of the universe. I'm important and special and faithful and obedient. And I have a message that you need to hear. That's empowerment. John Knox was uh, one of the leaders in the Reformation. He was not a nice person. I mean, you, if I were a pastor, I wouldn't want him in my church in nothing but trouble looking for a place to happen. He got arrested five times. <laughs> and uh, this is the 16th century and Mary Queen of Scots absolutely hated him. Um, he was arrested the last time thrown in prison for months. And when he got out, he died shortly after that. Uh, when he confronted the queen, she would say, John Knox, why do you do this to me? And Knox would say, if you did what was right, you wouldn't hear a peep from me. So he died. You know what Mary, Queen of Scots, said about John Knox? She said, I fear the prayers of John Knox more than an army of 10,000 men. If you listen to what I taught you this morning, they'll say the same thing about you. You think about that. Amen. So let's thank Dr. Steve Brown for bringing us the word this morning. It's been so good to hear from you. Encouraging. Well, before we head out of here, I have just a few things for you, so bear with me. If you stop by the Green Cultivate Wall on your way out, you can find out a lot more information about our weekly programming for young adults, students, and kids. You can also find out more information about our life groups at that wall, as well as some summer information. We have summer camps coming up that we're really excited about. So we have some people there to answer any questions you might have about that. And then in two weekends from now, April 27th and 28th, we are having the fair trade market right here in the foyer over that weekend. And that's a market to help support our anti-human trafficking ministry, One to One Hope. So be sure to bring some extra cash, maybe buy um, a present for your mom or any Mother's Day presents you might need to pick up or invite a friend. That's a great time to invite somebody new. And lastly, please don't leave here if you feel like you need to pray with somebody. We're gonna have a prayer team coming up here um, at the end of our service and they'd be happy to pray for you. If healing is something that you're in need of mentally or physically, we have a team of leaders and elders in the back prayer room and they'd be happy to pray over you as well. So as we go from here, Northland Church, may we be a people that knows the power of the gospel and walk and live in its truth daily. You are sent to be the salt and light of the world. We'll see you next week.